No, no. That would have been a nice intro clip. Anyways, I've built this snake game in Minecraft without data packs and mods, and here is how it was. Before doing anything, I need to have a concrete, in-depth, step-by-step plan of what I'm going to do. So I'm glad to present you this masterpiece. The first thing I'm going to do is research. The thing is, the last time I've played the game was probably 10 years ago, so I just kinda need to know what I'm building. Second step is the actual building, which will also have its sub-steps, but we'll get back to this later. Third step is testing. Fourth is fixing bugs. Then testing. Then fixing bugs. Then testing. Then fix it. Yeah, I kind of have an infinite loop at the end of my plan, but like no one said it had to be efficient, J just in depth. The research stage was pretty fast. I just googled the snake game, found this video about the game's evolution, and stopped at the version of 1997, which is the closest to what I remember I was playing 10 years ago. Then I also found this website with the game itself, and th this is pretty much what I want to build. So, since we're done with the research, let's get down to building. Before writing any commands, I decided to build the actual playfield, which is gonna be 19 by 19 blocks in our case, just because this way I can censure the snake, and I like when I can censure something, and I, I, I don't like when I cannot. Anyways, after the playfield, I've built a basic command block circuit. These are all empty command blocks for now, where all the top lines, aka modules, are connected underground. So all the command blocks here are being executed within one tick. If you're curious, this was my advanced plan for this circuit. Yeah, the whole reason why this project was successful. The first module is going to be responsible for start and restart functionality, such as creation of scoreboard, filling the whole playfit with armor stands, which will allow me to operate the snake, and a basic timer, so I can make the snake move slower or faster. Scoreboard and timer are two pretty simple concepts. For scoreboard, we are just basically creating a scoreboard. And the timer is just two command blocks, one which always sets one point to a specific player within the scoreboard, and one which reacts when the score reaches a certain number, then sends a signal, reset the score, and the process repeats. The real question is, how do you fill a 19 by 19 block area with armor stands? You see, the problem is, in Minecraft, we cannot fill an area with entities the same way we do with blocks. There is just no such command. Although there is a known workaround. The execute command allows us to run commands from the perspective of any entity or player. So here's what I'm gonna do. Firstly, using the set coordinates, I'm going to summon just one armor stand in the corner. Then, I'm gonna write something that we can translate in human language the following way. From the perspective of every armor stand, summon one more armor stand with the relative offset of 1 by x axis. So this one armor stand will spawn one more over here. Now second command will be almost the same, but the offset is now two blocks, so this armor stand will summon one more over here, and this will spawn one more armor stand over here. Then we just repeat the command with an offset of 4, 8, and this way we get to 16 entities spawned. But we need 19. The problem is that if we run the previous command with the offset of 3 to get 19, we will have a lot of duplicates. To fix this, let's adjust the command just a bit. From the perspective of every armor stand, summon one more armor stand with the relative offset of 3 by x axis, unless there is already an entity at the destination block. And the common looks something like this. Then we're just gonna repeat the whole thing but for z axis. And here's what we get. Every armor stand here has two tags, snake game, which is irrelevant to functionality, and an empty tag, which basically says that this block is not a snake. Now I'm gonna create a basic snake by changing tags of armor stands in the center to body. Then I'm going to spawn a candy by randomly selecting one entity which is not body. And this should be it for the start. To conclude, here is what we have at the end of start module. The whole field covered with entities, a basic snake, randomly spawned candy, scoreboard, and the timer. 
To move the head of our snake, we'll first we'll need to read player's inputs. I've decided to make first four slots of the inventory be the controls. First slot is movement up, second slot is left, third is down, and fourth is right. Then I just rebound my own controls to the arrows and keyboard, and it was done. To read player's inputs, I've built a small sub-module over here, which function is pretty simple. Whenever a player presses one of controls, it will set the score of corresponding direction to 1 and every other direction to 0. At the same time, it will not react to swift movements. For example, if player was moving left and pressed right, this input will be simply ignored. After input reader is ready, we're simply connecting it with the head movement by moving the head tag relatively to the controls. By the way, I forgot to mention, but the first block of the snake is tagged as head and not just body, just so we can separate it. Also, if you're curious how exactly do I move the head, remember that using execute, we can perform commands from the perspective of a specific entity. So yeah, after we've connected controls with the head movement, the only thing that's left to do is to just add a check to see if um, the game isn't lost. Basically, if the head is moving towards entity with empty tag, it's okay and the game continues. If the head is stepping on the entity with the body tag, the game is done because we just simply hit the tail. At the same time, since swift movements are ignored, the player cannot kill the snake by moving backwards. And if we hit the wall, considering the specifics of head movement, the program will simply try to pass the head tag to an empty space outside of the border, which results in losing the head in general. So we're just gonna add one more separate check to see if the head is still on the board. And if it's not, the game is also done. To conclude, we can now read player's inputs, move the head and identify if the game is lost. While writing the module for the body movement, I spent more than an hour on just one command block. At the end of the day, all we need to do to move the body is to just remove the last block, aka tail, of the snake. But how do we know what block is the last one? Basically, I've had a few ideas. First of all, we can do the opposite of the task and check if the block is simply not in the middle. For example, here we can clearly see the last block because it has only one connection, while all the other blocks have two connections. Simple, right? Yes. That's why it doesn't work. Because if we move the snake somewhat like this, this block, will, while being the last one, now also has two connections. Second idea is that we can just add all the body blocks to the scoreboard where each new block will have its score greater by 1 than the previous. Then we just select the block with the smallest value and remove it. Now, the problem with this is that it might work in theory, but would be a hell to work with in terms of controlling the exact locations of where new blocks are appearing when the snake eats a candy. Therefore, here is the final solution. You see, when we move the head, it's not only passing the head tag to the next entity, but at the same time it marks current entity with an additional tag stating its direction. It's actually easier to just show it. So for example, here is the pole snake. If we look underneath, the armor stands below are forming kind of a history of head rotations. Considering that we have this information, how would you find the last block? Right. The last block is the block which is not being pointed at from any direction. And this works in any scenario. Here is the command to identify if the block is not being pointed at, and I'm not even going to explain it. So at the end of body movement module, we have something like this. After the previous module, eating candy seems like an easy task. Remember how at the beginning only the head was moving and the whole body was just frozen? Well, we kinda need the same thing here, but just for one cycle whenever the snake eats a candy. To identify that we actually just ate something, we just need to check whether our head is stepping on an entity tagged as candy. If it happens, we freeze the body for one turn and that's it, easy as that. Now to spawn a new candy, as mentioned before, we just randomly selecting one of the armor stands tagged as empty. Man, trust me, after the body module, this one was just a relief. Now when everything is ready, we can prettify the whole thing. First of all, let's make all the armor stands invisible. Then let's make a way to remotely start the program, add a countdown at the start and a message at the end. And after all this hard work, let's just simply play the game. 
If you enjoyed this video, could you do me a favor and like, leave a like and a comment, you know? See ya! I'm still not good at it though. <laughs>